for this. So, uh, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight for this talk by Dr. Debbie Nash. Um, Debbie is a senior lecturer at Aberystwyth University. Uh, she obtained her PhD at the Royal Veterinary College, where she optimized and validated a laboratory model to study uterine inflammation in horses. On completion of her PhD, Debbie moved to the Institute of Biological, Environmental and Rural Science at Aberystwyth University and took up a lecturing post. In Aberystwyth, in Aberystwyth she expanded the use of laboratory models to bovine uterine inflammation. And more recently, Debbie has been using these laboratory models as screening tests for novel anti-inflammatory plant-derived extract that may minimize prolonged antibiotic use and enhance the efficacy of treatment of bovine uterine inflammation. Alongside her research, Debbie teaches reproductive physiology as well as nutrition and equine exercise physiology. Now we'll pass the ball to Debbie, who will talk about a taste of animal science, biology's top models for improving animal health. Thank you, Debbie. Oh, well, thank you, Manny. Thank you for that very detailed introduction. Um, <laughs> you've remembered more about myself than I have, so thank you for that. Um, and also, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to present this evening as well. I'm always really pleased to talk about animal science. But what I'm hoping to convey this evening is the importance of animal science in the wider field of biology as well. So the aim of this evening is to perhaps think about what animal science is and also how we can deliver animal science teaching and what's typical across the UK. Um, but also hopefully, as I say, give an example of some of the research that we do within the field of animal science. And my own sort of special niche is biological models. So that's clearly the example that I'm hoping to give this evening. So I'm going to split the presentation into two parts. Um, the first part is going to be a little bit more brief, and that's going to be the overview of teaching and learning and how we deliver that. And then the second slightly longer part will be the examples of animal research and the biological models. So that's where the biological models will hopefully um, come in. And um, so next slide, please. So um, to start with teaching and learning, um, I'm going to frame this in the context of the teaching that we do at Aberystwyth, mainly because that's my most recent and long-standing experience of delivering teaching in the animal sciences field. Um, and click. So um, what is animal science? And I think the best way to describe animal science is that it is very similar to zoology. But rather than studying a range of organisms from the microscopic all the way up to something as large as an elephant, we are focusing the studies on domesticated species. So this will include farm animals, horses and other companion animals at the same time. And understanding the biology of these animals is really important because it enables us to support the correct management, the health and the welfare of these animals when they're directly in our care. So what on earth are we going to study if we're looking to study animal science? And certainly we'll be studying anatomy and physiology. And we apply that to certain body systems and certain uh, management practices. So for example, you could be learning about the anatomy of the digestive tract and also the physiology of digestion. And at the same time, we might be trying to learn about um, the intake of certain animals for certain um, purposes, for certain production purposes. So the underlying science is absolutely key to then informing what we do in practice in terms of management and care of these animals, um, both for their own well-being and their, for their health, but also for the productivity, um, so for commercial purposes too. Um, we can apply the same principles to reproduction, so how do we um, maximise fertility, so what's the science underlying fertility, and also the care of young stock as well. Um, if you're interested in performance animals, such as um, dogs and horses, so they obviously do um, tasks for us, some um, competitive tasks for us, then we can also study exercise physiology, which is pretty much sports science for animals as well. Um, the key question I often get asked about animal science is, well, where can this lead me in terms of a career? So there are a few examples that I can give you. Um, lots of our students go on and then study physiotherapy. So they do an animal science degree and then as a postgraduate course, they will become qualified physiotherapists, but um, veterinary physiotherapists. 
Um, and as a completely different example, I've just had a student who has now become a member of the British um, Horse Racing Authority, and she's part of their anti-doping team. So what she's doing is she's making sure that the regulations are in place and the testing is in place to ensure that um, horses aren't going onto the racetrack with banned substances in their system. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the particular field of animal science. Um, but leading on from that, we now have an allied field with a further specialism in, the, in supporting veterinary practice. So we also now teach veterinary bioscience. And this would also include learning about anatomy and physiology. But there's particular focus on uh, disease uh, immunology. It could also include pharmacology, as well as controlling diseases as well. So the management of disease control. And again, in terms of career progression, we have lots of students who actually go on to work for nutrition companies. That tends to be actually very popular. So you could be working for a company formulating animal feeds, which then end up on the shelf um, that uh, all sort of animal owners will then go on and buy. Um, you could also be in your nutrition role, um, perhaps visiting individual farms and helping farmers to formulate diets for their specific herd of animals as well. Um, another example then, I've just had a student who's done this course and she's now studying chiropractic um, in, in America. And I should say lots of students who do these types of courses, both animal and veterinary bioscience, use it as a stepping stone to veterinary medicine as well. So if they didn't get into veterinary medicine the first time around, so perhaps their A-levels weren't quite um, where they needed to be, then they will come and do an undergraduate degree and then they will reapply to veterinary school after that. Um, the other thing that I should mention is that all of these schemes can lead on to postgraduate qualifications, so masters or MRes, um, and lots of people indeed go into teaching and research afterwards as well. Um, click. So, um, in terms of examples of courses at undergraduate level, um, here at Aberystwyth we run um, animal science, and if you could click through three or four at a time. Um, that's it, perfect. Um, so we run a BSc in animal science, a BSc in veterinary bioscience. Um, but you might also be surprised to know that there's a real um, appetite out there for equine specific courses. So um, the equine world is, um, is, you know, a very sort of extensive um, industry in the UK. And lots of people really want to focus on those species. So we also offer specialist degrees um, in those two topics as well. Um, I should probably state a disclaimer here um, that obviously other higher education providers of these courses are also available around the UK. So we're not the only people that um, that, that put on these courses. Um, but as I say, these, these are what I'm most experienced with in terms of Aberystwyth. Um, next slide, please. Um, but one very exciting development at Aberystwyth is that as of this September, we will be having our first intake of students doing a veterinary science degree. So in five years time, as these students go through and complete that course, um, they will be qualified as veterinary surgeons. So effectively, Aberystwyth is becoming a vet school and indeed will be the first vet school to open in Wales. Um, this scheme is being put on with, as a collaboration with the Royal Veterinary College. And just like all vet schools across the UK, it's a five year course and the first two years consist of preclinical studies. So that means learning the anatomy, the physiology, the founding biology of all the species that they will then go on to treat. But the final three years, so years three, four and five are the clinical years, which means this is where you're really learning the skills of becoming a veterinary surgeon. Um, essentially, this is where you learn to diagnose and treat animals. So the way in which our course is going to be a little bit different to um, other vet schools is that you will come to Aberystwyth to do years one and two, your preclinical years, and then you will actually go to the RVC on their Hawkshead campus just north of London to do years three, four and five. And we're hoping that this is going to be quite beneficial to um, certain groups of students. So first of all, it means that they're coming to Aberystwyth, and I'll show you where Aberystwyth is on a map in just a second, but um, as you're probably aware, it's a very rural setting. And actually, if you were doing vet science at traditional universities, um, those first two years are often based in a city. Most vet schools have sprung up around sort of cities. And so because you're not learning to treat or diagnose animals, those first two years tend to be 
um, on the inner city campuses. So at London, for example, you would be spending most of your time in Camden. But that doesn't suit every student out there. So those coming from a rural background might find that um, a little bit of a culture shock. So we hopefully offer a rural setting for students that that would suit um, much better. Um, now, all veterinary science degrees have to cover the whole range of species. So that's large animal, companion animals and exotics as well. Um, but because we have certain facilities at Aberystwyth that have been long standing because of our history of teaching not only animal science, but agriculture as well. We have a real emphasis on um, farms, dairy farms, beef and sheep as well. So um, although we will cover all the species in order to enable these students to become registered veterinary surgeons, we're really hoping that we particularly encourage those with an interest in large animals. And in fact, there is a real um, deficiency of vets out there going into large animal practice. Um, the other advantage is that um, even after you finish your uh, preclinical years in Aberystwyth and go to um, London, that doesn't mean to say you won't ever get to come back to Aberystwyth. Um, we are hoping that in your final three years, when you need to do work experience, that we will be able to provide that locally. Um, we have lots of stakeholders surrounding us in Aberystwyth, whether that's vet practices or farms. Um, so that's certainly an option for these students. And um, final year rotations um, could also take place in Aberystwyth. So um, rotations involved um, following vets on specialism. So that could be small animal surgery or it could be dairy farm medicine. So for the large animal components of that, again, they could come back to us. Um, the final benefit might be quite surprising, but it's interesting how many students um, this really is attractive to. In that, as we have an equine yard here at the university as part of our animal and equine schemes, um, that also means that if you're a vet student, you can actually bring your horse to university with you. And again, for traditionally for veterinary science schemes, um, if you had a student who had a horse and was very encased in the equestrian world, um, they're about to go off and do a five year degree, the first two years of which were often in a city. So that often wasn't an option to them. And in fact, um, it's quite amazing how many students have to sell their horses before they go to vet school. Um, so as a little bit more of a carrot to come to Aberystwyth, um, it is possible to bring your horse for at least the first two years. Um, oh, next slide, please. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so here we are, we're right over on the west coast there. If, if you went any further west than Aberystwyth, you'd um, fall into the sea. So um, that's where we are. And um, I just wanted to perhaps illustrate some of the facilities that we have that not only are going to support our vet students, but we'll also, um, are also supporting our existing animal, equine and our agriculture students as well. Um, so you can see the town of Aberystwyth on the um, sort of zoomed in map there. Um, it's a relatively small town, but it's very much uh, student orientated. We are a university town. And about a mile outside of the campus, we have our equine unit and we have stabling for about 55 horses there. Some of those are, belonged, uh, are owned by the university but the remaining stables are then available for students to, to bring their own horses. And indeed, that's um, very popular. Um, about three or four miles outside of Avarice with them, we have our Go Gathern um, sheep and beef unit. And that's um, really um, a, a very important resource for our students. So come springtime, students are able to sign up um, to do lambing so they can sit up um, with uh, ewes that are lambing. And I'm not going to go through all of the farms, but um, about six or seven miles to the southeast, uh, we have our Trouskoy dairy unit. Um, we have 400, I think it might even be pushing 450 head of dairy cattle there. So students can not only come along and learn about how to manage the health and nutrition and the welfare of our animals there, but they also get to see how a commercial farm is run, which is a really important experience um, for those students to have. Um, so this was a very brief overview and I hope that's given you a little insight as to the teaching that we can deliver in terms of animal, um, equine and veterinary biosciences. Um, and yeah, this is hopefully a typical institution that would deliver those throughout the UK. OK, next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to move on to part two now of the presentation. And I'd like to give a flavour of the research that is conducted in the field of animal science and one that makes a real contribution to animal health and welfare. And so for this, I would like to talk about uh, biological models. 
And as an animal scientist, I use them quite extensively and in lots of different ways, um, as do many of my colleagues. So a biological model is a process, is basically the meaning of a biological model is where a process that occurs in a living organism um, is recreated and simulated in a laboratory setting. Um, and what I would like to present to you today is why these models are necessary and how they can be real alternatives to using live animal studies. And at the very least, they can replace, refine and reduce the need for live animal research. I'm so quick. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to ask you, the audience, I want you to think about um, what thoughts come into your head when you think of the term animal research? So what does animal research mean to you? And it is a term that is quite rightly um, evokes emotive thoughts and quite possibly some of those are going to be relatively negative as well. So if you pop the term animal research into Google, um, the first couple of websites that come up are actually relating to being anti-animal testing. Um, and that's probably unsurprising. But if you scroll down to a few more on the list, um, you'll also see that there are links to websites that are dedicated to understanding how research with animals is conducted. Um, and click. Brilliant. Um, so these um, particular organisations and bodies are um, dedicated to understanding or, and also promoting the fact that animal research can be conducted very carefully and as ethically as possible. And it's really important that animal research is questioned um, and we need to challenge animal research to make sure that it is ethical and welfare is placed under the highest degree of consideration and regulation as well. But what I would like you to consider today is that um, there are lots of aspects of animal research and they're not all necessarily related to animal testing. So as an animal scientist, um, like any other scientist, I conduct experiments. But quite often those experiments are actually aimed at the benefit for the health and the welfare of the animal that I'm working with. And sometimes, depending on the nature of the work, um, there could be follow on benefits either for other species or even humans themselves. So I would like to argue that this work does not need to be invasive and it doesn't necessarily need to compromise that animal's welfare in achieving its aims. So um, the key point here really is that animal research is not necessarily animal testing. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to give a few examples of animal research. And here is an example of some work that's been led by one of my colleagues, um, where this research is primarily to benefit that of the animal's well-being itself, uh, but also has cost benefits to the farmer as well. So this particular work comes under the field of precision agriculture. And what you can see here, and this is where I'm going to, um, uh, oh, I can use my mouse. Um, so yeah, so um, you can just see there's a little orange strip there attached to the cow's leg. And if you look really closely, there's an orange strip as well on the head collar of the cow. So it's a, an orange on a red background, but there is a little orange strip there. And on the calf, there's also an orange strip on that calf's leg as well. And what we've done there is we've attached accelerometers to the leg or the head collar of these cows. And these accelerometers can detect very subtle alterations in the animal's movement. And work has been done to show that we can characterize different behaviors such as feeding, lying and standing. And we can use these sensors to detect very small changes in those behaviors and in actual fact, we can then use them as proxies for identifying health issues uh, much earlier than you can detect them by eye. So, for example, there might be a change in an animal's locomotion, which indicates lameness much earlier than we could actually detect just by observation. Um, and other diseases that we might be able to detect would include things like mastitis and milk fever, as well as lameness. And in the calf, we might also be able to um, have information that relates to growth rates and also detection of things like pneumonia. So diagnosing these health conditions at the earliest possible stage not only ensures better welfare for the animal, but remember a happy cow is a very productive cow. So whether that's in terms of milk yields or growth rates, 
um, productivity is going to be maximised in this case. And this all is also going to keep the farmer very happy at the same time. Um, these sensors are very small and as you can see they're very easily attached to the animal's leg or head collar. In fact they're just attached with a vet wrap bandage and so they really don't adversely affect the animal um, whatsoever. So I hope that's a good example of some research with very positive benefits. Um, and I should thank uh, Dr. Manod Williams, who is a colleague of mine, who has provided me with the images um, and has also given me a little insight to his work over the last uh, few months. Okay, next slide, please. So here's another example of some animal research. Um, companion animals, which we sometimes include horses, um, they're beginning to live much longer now because of improved veterinary care, because of improved veterinary science and animal science. So we're keeping animals longer into their old age, but that also comes with other issues. Um, and for example, here um, comes with issues such as arthritis. Now, um, anyone who owns a pet or a horse um, is probably well aware, and I fall into this trap as well, that I don't feel like I'm a very good animal owner if I'm not spending about 50 or 60 quid a month on some sort of supplement. And we certainly have joint supplements that we now can feed our animals to try and mitigate the effects of osteoarthritis, for example. But when we feed that whole, um, animal or whatever it is, dog, cat um, or horse, when we feed them that supplement, does that supplement actually affect any part of their existing diet? So what we are trying to show in this experiment here is we're actually trying to measure the digestibility of feed depending on whether the animal has had a supplement added in or not. So um, obviously this experiment was being done in horses and this horse here has been trained very gradually and very gently um, to become adapted to wearing um, this contraption here. And um, what he's got on here, this is what we inventively refer to as an equine nappy. And this allows us to measure what goes in, because we can control that, we can measure that before we give it the animal. Um, and importantly, perhaps unfortunately, we can also measure what comes out. And because of that, we can calculate then what gets digested in the middle. And so this is very important to assess whether feeding a supplement affects the digestibility of that animal's feed. So in terms of any um, adverse effects on the animal or animal welfare, I would have to argue that collecting those fecal samples probably affects the welfare of the person collecting it more than it affects the animal itself. Um, all this chap had to do was eat the food that was put in front of him. Um, and I happen to know this particular guy very well. And I can tell you eating was not a problem for this horse in this experiment. Um, so as you can see, with these last two examples I've given you, um, animal research um, of these domesticated species often involves a lot of field work. And it means getting out there on farms and in yards um, and basically getting your hands dirty. But in addition to that, animal studies are very labour intensive. They're very expensive. Um, it's also very time consuming. So it took her several weeks to uh, train the horse to accept this harness very gradually without compromising his welfare. But also when you're thinking about feeding diets, you might have to feed them for two weeks on a diet before your experiment can begin to allow for adaptation. Um, so that means we can't um, experiment, we can't test lots of different products all in one go. So even though we're using animals for very non-invasive research, um, actually using the live animal in this case is not always ideal. It's not very efficient. And in fact, this is where a laboratory simulation or a model comes in very, very handy. Um, and click. Great. Um, so laboratory models are often much cheaper. They're less labor intensive and they enable a high throughput. So we can test many samples in a very short space of time. And in some cases, they can actually be safer to run as well. Um, animals tend to have teeth and hooves and can be quite unpredictable. So um, there are health risks sometimes to the experimenter as well. Um, so the image I've got on the right hand side here is actually a, an experiment where we're testing digestibility of a feed, just like we were doing in the animal. Um, and in fact, we're looking at the digestibility of fibre in this particular experiment. Um, and what you can see here is there's about 15 and there's probably actually 20 bottles lined up there. 
that's 15 or 20 different um, su uh, supplements that we were testing. And um, we would have needed 15 or 20 horses to do this all in one go, which often isn't very practical. And I should say, this image was actually taken during an undergraduate student practical. So we ran these 15 or 20 samples within a three hour practical one afternoon and still got very meaningful results. So much quicker and a much more efficient process. Um, so hopefully that um, demonstrates why models are so useful in the world of animal research. But there are some circumstances when a model needs to enable the testing of live cells or tissues. So for example, we want, might want to investigate how cells react when they're challenged with a bacteria, or perhaps a little bit more relevant for today, a virus. And we might want to know how the cell responds to that challenge, um, how the bacteria or the virus invades it. And other types of experiments which are really useful is actually for testing treatments. So if we challenge tissues or cells with a bacteria or a virus, could we add in potential new drugs which might perhaps um, mitigate or combat the body's response to that bacteria? So for example, if the response is to set up inflammation, and inflammation is good in the short term, but we don't want it persisting for long periods of time, then can we add in drugs to that system and perhaps knock back that inflammation? So it's really important that we can run these experiments on live cells and tissues as well. Uh, next slide, please. So where on earth do we get those cells and tissues from? And I would like to argue that it is possible to harvest those cells and tissues from humans and animals without compromising the welfare of the donor. Um, and that's some of the work that I'm involved in. But I wanted to give a little bit of a historical background as well to where this work with cells first came about. So the first cell model was established in 1951 and it followed many, many failures at trying to grow cells in a laboratory setting. And um, the cells that were first successfully cultured were actually collected from a black American woman called Henrietta Lacks who was suffering from cervical tumour at the time. So they collected these cervical tumour cells and for the first time ever these particular cells were grown successfully and we have to grow them in a nutrient medium, so a fluid um, that provides them with all the nutrients that they need. But it was this particular medium that was um, devised by a biologist called George Gay and um, he perfected the ingredients into that medium and it was his assistant, Mary Kubitschek, who actually collected the cells and grew them up herself. And now, as I say, it was a combination um, that led to the success of these particular cells of the fact that these cells grew very prolifically because cancer cells grow like wildfire. And finally hitting on the right ingredients for the nutrient mediums that they were being grown in and also the environmental conditions as well. And that's why these cells were, in particular, were, be, were able to be maintained um, in that laboratory setting. So these cells, these HeLa cells, are an immortal cell line. So so long as you give them the right conditions, they can grow indefinitely. And in fact, they still grow today. So these cells who originated from this one woman still grow today. Um, and in fact, you could order them from a scientific supply company and they would arrive in your lab sort of three or four days later. And they have been used for a multitude of groundbreaking studies. So they've been involved in developing the polio vaccine as well as cancer research as well. Um, the cells were named HeLa cells after Henrietta Lacks herself. Um, but the story of um, Henrietta was a very sad one. She obviously had cervical cancer and she actually died soon after the cells were harvested. And there has been quite a lot of controversy um, surrounding the use of those cells and also the permissions um, required to have used them. Um, if you just click, there we go. So um, it's probably out with the remit of my talk this evening to go into what happened to those cells and um, the controversy that surrounded them. Um, but I will refer you to an excellent book by uh, Rebecca Skloot. This isn't a scientific text, it's a, it's a really good read. Um, so that will give you lots more background on, on where these cells first came from. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. 
So since HeLa cells were first cultured, the use of fresh cells or even pieces of tissue from, um, for, for, uh, for, collected from animals um, has now become commonplace. So cell cultures, tissue cultures, um, they go on across thousands of labs all over the world. And as an example of types of animal research that we use them for, um, I work in a group that models uterine inflammation. So we're really interested in inflammatory problems that relate to the uterus of both cattle and horses. So you might wonder, well, who cares if a, a cow or a horse gets uh, a uterine inflammation? Um, but actually it is a big problem because infection of the uterus leads to very poor fertility. Um, now this picture on the left hand side here, you might be wondering, well, blimey, why she put up a picture of a cow's backside? Um, but what I want to point out to you, um, and again, if I can um, somehow uh, direct you with the mouse here, at the bottom, there we go, right where your mouse is, down, down a bit, left a bit, right a bit, right there, where your mouse is now, um, that is actually a pool of pus that has dripped out of the reproductive tract of the cow, um, which just illustrates exactly how um, significant and how extensive these infections are. Um, you know, there is no way an animal with that degree of inflammation is going to become pregnant. Now, in terms of dairy cows, the longer a dairy cow goes before becoming pregnant, the longer it is until she produces milk. And that is going to adversely affect her productivity. Um, and it costs the EU about, well, over 130 million euros every year to treat this problem. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about Europe anymore, but um, those are the figures that I have. Um, so we have a laboratory model of uterine inflammation um, for the condition both in horses and cattle, and that enables us to recreate the inflammation in the lab. And more recently, we've been using that to screen potential anti-inflammatory products. So the idea of these is that if we find ones that are um, effective, then we can improve and hasten the treatment of this condition and lead to pregnancies much earlier um, in the reproductive cycle. But to recreate this in the laboratory, we need live uterine cells um, for some experiments and we need pieces of tissue for others. So where on earth am I going to get pieces of uterus without compromising animal welfare? Well, the answer to that is that it's a fact that every day thousands of cattle are sent to UK abattoirs as part of the meat production process. Um, you might also be surprised to know that over 100 horses a week are also sent to abattoirs in the UK. Um, although I should say the meat is actually sent to the continent, um, we don't consume that in the UK, or at least we don't think we do. Um, but of course, as part of that process, a lot of the tissues which are of great interest to animal scientists are actually discarded. So the uteri are just thrown in the bin. Um, but what that means is that so long as the animal is going through an abattoir for reasons that are completely unrelated to the study, we can harvest those tissues um, and actually we can harvest them for free, which is even better. Um, could you click through uh, about one, two, uh, that's it, and the next one. Perfect. Thank you very much. So what we do essentially is we trot along to the abattoir, um, we collect the uteri, and the image in the middle there is a uterus which I've dissected and opened out. So you can see the surface of the uterus there, the uterine lining, which is what we want. And I can do two things with those. I can um, take pieces of those endometrium and almost like little biopsy sections. And I can culture those as whole pieces of tissue. And you can see those in the top right hand diagram there. So these are little pieces of tissue. Perfect, thank you. Um, one piece of tissue in one well. So these are wells um, in a six well plate. Um, what you can't quite see there though is that they are covered in that nutrient medium, but the nutrient medium is transparent. So um, you can't see it there, but they are floating in that special nutrient um, uh, solution that they need to grow. Um, the bottom picture then, the one just beneath it, is where we have taken the uterine tissue, but we've actually isolated cells into their component types and what you can see here is one type of cell that we collect from the uterus which are stromal cells and they are growing on a flat surface and they've spread out over that surface and we can then use those for experiments too. So the next question is well we've got these tissues and these cells so what does a typical experiment look like? 
Uh, next slide, please. So for those tissues that we keep as whole little pieces, almost little biopsy sections, um, we call those tissue explants. So what we do with these is we go along to the abattoir, we collect the uteri and we dissect out the um, uterine lining. And we then wash that lining, um, little pieces of it, in a sterile buffered salt solution. Um, and then we culture it in the medium. Um, if you could click through three times, I think. Perfect. Lovely. Um, so you can see here, um, this is the same image on the bottom right here that you saw on the previous page, but you can see these pieces of tissue being cultured in their medium. And because the medium is transparent, the schematic diagram above is just a very simple way of showing you how the explant just kind of floats really in the nutrient medium. But it's not enough just to give them all the ingredients they need to grow. We also need to trick them into thinking that they're in an environment such as the, the whole body, such as the live animal. So we also keep these plates with our tissues in, in an incubator. And it's set at 37 degrees C and either 5 or 10% CO2. And that mimics conditions in the body. So we're basically tricking these tissues into thinking that they're still in the live animal. And that enables them to carry on functioning as though they are. So how do we then set up an experiment? Well, um, this is all related to how we prepare that nutrient medium. So if we look at that diagram again on the um, bottom right, you'll see they come at the well, there are six wells in a plate and they come in pairs, so two, four and six pairs. And in the first pair of wells, um, we would just simply add the nutrient medium all by itself. So that would be our control um, samples. And then the middle two wells, we would also add in the medium. But in addition to that, we would add in something that we know in real life causes inflammation. So we could be adding in a bacteria or we could be adding in a small part of a bacteria. But basically, it's an inflammatory stimulant. And then in the final two wells on the end there, we add in these inflammatory stimulants. So again, it was either the bacteria or part of a bacteria but also a potential um, compound which we think might have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, if you click once more, great. So that's how we administer the treatments. The treatments are basically dissolved in the nutrient medium that we then um, expose those explants to. Um, next two clicks. Perfect. Well, that's all very well, but how are we then going to measure how those cells are responding? And actually, if you add bacteria onto these tissues and they still think that they are in the live animal, then they will respond by manufacturing what we call immune mediators. Now, these could be proteins or they could be hormones that send emergency signals out to the rest of the body. Now, obviously, the rest of the body doesn't exist here. But what they do is they secrete those products out into the nutrient medium. So about 24 or 72 hours later, what we do is we take tiny samples of the nutrient medium and we analyze it for any one of these different components, any one of these inflammatory mediators. Um, final click. Brilliant. So um, we call them inflammatory mediators or markers, um, but basically they indicate inflammation. And a typical example of this would be um, the hormone and inflammatory mediator that we call prostaglandin. And what we're hoping to see is that obviously in the untreated controls, there's no response. So prostaglandin doesn't get secreted. Where we have added the inflammatory stimulant, so that's probably the bacteria, we hope prostaglandin increases. Um, but if we then in our final set of wells have that potential anti-inflammatory drug, if it works, it will actually reduce the prostaglandin back down to basal levels. So that would indicate to us um, that that potentially is having an anti-inflammatory effect. So these explants or tissues are really synonymous to the whole animal because within each of these tissues, we've got all the different cell types that are present as they would be in life and in the same structure as well. So we're maintaining the tissue architecture. And so any response to antigens is the response of the cells working together as they would do in the whole animal. 
But sometimes it's important to separate out the different cell types that are within that tissue. So we can grow these in isolation. And this is important to determine which cells are specifically responsible for certain responses. And although this is really a step away from the whole animal, um, it does enable an extra level of detail and understanding. So this is where cell culture work then also comes in, in hand. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, I just wanted to give you an insight then as to how cell culture experiments would work in order to achieve the same thing, to assess how a cell responds and work out if a potential anti-inflammatory has the desired effect. Now there are variations on this technique and it does depend on which cells you're culturing and um, it also has variations between labs as well. But essentially what this involves is collecting your uterus again, dissecting it out and taking the lining of the uterus um, and then click, lovely. And then you put those pieces of the lining into this sort of centrifuge here and the liquid that you can see there, sorry, centrifuge tube, um, and the liquid that you can see there is actually a solution of enzymes which help to separate the connective tissue from between the cells. So what you're doing really is you're liberating the cells from the tissue. Um, we then go through a series of filtering. So on this second centrifuge tube here, you can just see a little filter on top. Perfect, brilliant, thank you. And you, you know, you just pour your solution through once it's been digested by the enzymes. So you're removing any of the larger debris. So hopefully you're retaining your cells in the bottom. And then click. Perfect. And another click. Another one for luck. There we go. Great. Um, and we're also then centrifuging those cells. Um, so if we spin them around really fast, um, the purified cells will then sink to the bottom of the tube. And you can just see a tiny little pellet there at the bottom of the centrifuge tube. So we can discard all the liquid that's above the pellet. Um, and um, we then hopefully have a relatively pure population of cells. In fact, we should have a very pure population of cells. Um, what we do then to enable them to start to grow and function is we seed them or we just transport them into this flask which you can see in the middle here so we put all of those cells um, onto the bottom of the flask in fact we actually count them so we know exactly how many we're putting in um, and we put them into the bottom of the flask and that pink um, solution there is the same nutrient medium very similar nutrient medium to the one we saw on the previous slide and hopefully, if they're happy and healthy, what they will do is they will um, adhere to the bottom of the plastic and they will start to grow in a monolayer across the surface of the flask. Um, I think it's one more click. Brilliant. So again, this is the diagram I showed you on the previous stage, but, uh, slide, but these are the cells growing across the surface of the um, plastic. Um, we also have to incubate them, just like we did with the explants, so click, brilliant. And again, the same conditions, 37 degrees C, because that's body temperature, um, usually 5 or 10 percent CO2, so that mimics um, the body conditions. Um, and, and then we should hopefully have cells that are ready for an experiment. But they do need a little bit of maintenance, so they are a little bit more fussy than the explants. So as they start to grow, they use up the medium and the ingredients in it very quickly. So we, at regular intervals, have to change the medium. So we remove the old and put fresh in. Uh, and one more click. Okay. But something else that often happens is they start to overpopulate um, the, the bottom of that flask. So that means they start to compete for resources. Some cells come off a bit worse than others and they start to die. Um, and this isn't really a very good um, situation if you want to use those cells then for experiments. So often at regular intervals, what we have to do is before they start to overpopulate, we have to lift those cells off of the bottom of the flask and split them into two more flasks. So you're basically halving the population size, dividing them into two and then letting them grow on again. Um, so you can keep that process going for as long as you need to, really. But once those cells are healthy and happy, then we can start using them for an experiment very similar to that that we just saw in the explants. Um, click. Lovely. So in the explants, we saw tissue floating in six well plates. Um, cells are obviously much, much smaller, so we can do them in smaller wells, and we can have plates with up to 96 wells. 
But we would do exactly the same here. We would then expose them to just control medium, medium with our bacterial uh, stimulants, or sorry, our, um, our inflammatory stimulants, which could be a bacteria, and then also that combination with a drug as well. Um, and we would be measuring the same responses too. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so hopefully that's given an insight into the type of experiments we do um, and the type of results that we hope to expect. Um, but I want to kind of bring this back round now to animal welfare. So initially, those laboratory models completely replaced the need to do live animal research. Um, but eventually, we're going to have to test, for example, new drugs in live animals. We cannot legally um, just generate evidence for those in the lab and think, oh, well, they're looking really positive, and then think or expect them to then be in the vet's toolkit um, sort of the following uh, few months later. So we have to test them in live animals just to check that the animals don't have any reactions that we can't predict from the lab work. Having said that, the animal studies um, have to be approved by the Home Office. Any animal research that with um, using live animals um, that uses any sort of invasive procedure, whether that's taking a blood sample, has to be approved by the Home Office or you won't be able to legally do that work. And our laboratory models can actually pave the way for that research. And this is where the principles of the three R's comes in. So that's reduction, replacement and refinement. So as I mentioned, the laboratory um, models initially replace the live animal work but we can also use those models to test for toxicity so if a new drug appears to be toxic in the lab then we absolutely do not then subject animals to it in animal research we discard that drug completely from our um, workflow um, it also means that we can do experiments to determine the best dosage of drugs before we use that in the live animal. So we don't need to use lots of animals working out what the best dose is. So in that way, we're using the laboratory work to refine the number of animals that we're use, using and to reduce the number of animals that we're using. So obviously these are very advantageous studies to do. And in fact, the Home Office, license, uh, the home office won't grant an animal trial license unless the reduction, refinement and replacement can be demonstrated in the proposed plan of work. And that evidence is generated from the laboratory models, um, such as the ones that um, we've, I've been presenting this evening. So scientists are supported and encouraged to work within the three R's principles at all times. And there are lots of resources out there to support us as well. So one of those is provided by, this is a bit of a long-winded name, but the National Centre for Replacement, Refinement and Reductions of Animals in Research. Um, and I've just done a screenshot there of their website. It's a really good information resource and support for researchers in designing both their um, models, their laboratory models, but also their animal trials as well. So there's lots of resources out there to support us in working as ethically as possible at all times. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to finish there. I've probably gone over my 45 minutes and Manny's probably about uh, jumping up and down. Um, so, um, but what I would like to hopefully summarise is that animal research is not the same as animal testing. So I think it's really important sometimes to make that distinction. But animal research is often conducted for the benefit and well-being of the species being studied. And so it's a very necessary field of biology. Um, this animal research can be conducted whilst maintaining very high standards of animal welfare. And as a part of that, as a vital part of that, um, I would argue that laboratory models are necessary tools which enable the reduction, refinement and replacement of animal studies. Um, the tissue that we do use for laboratory model work can be collected without compromising animal well-being. And this is because we're basically using materials that are otherwise discarded um, at abattoirs in the UK. Um, and then final slide, please. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to end by uh, making sure that I thank a lot of people that have helped me um, with my work as a whole and also this presentation. 
Uh, Manod Williams, as I mentioned earlier, provided me with the images of the accelerometers on the cattle. Um, and as I said, I've been working with him a little bit more recently um, and, um, and I've had a really good insight to his work. Um, if you would like a full reference for that text on um, Henrietta Lacks, then it's by Rebecca Skloot and those are all of the details there. Um, I must uh, thank Martin Sheldon, who was my PhD supervisor some years ago, um, but he was the person who set up and first um, designed these particular models and it's variations on these that we're actually using in our lab um, for our experiments right now. And then from within my department, which is IBAS at Aberystwyth University, I must thank Ruth, Mike, Maite and Nathan. Uh, we've all been working on projects together, so um, I'm really grateful for all of their support as well. Um, and finally, certainly not least, I must thank everybody um, for joining in the presentation this evening. Um, I'm well aware it's quite late now on a Friday evening. Um, the pubs have recently opened, so um, I'm really quite flattered that anyone's come along this evening to learn about um, biological models. So thank you very much for your attention, um, and I hope that was a good insight to animal sort of models and, and animal science as a wider field as well. <laughs>